Hello everyone, it's open. No, it's not Open House Thursday. It's Wednesday <laughs> on Your View. Welcome to the show. I am Mariah Afo, Lavi Brown, as always. I have the ladies with me. Hello, Tokwe. How are you today? I'm very good, thank you. I'm running off the week. I'm ready for Thursday. Yeah, the reason why I'm ready for Thursday, actually, because I have so, I got so many clothes for okay. my brother last day. I have so many Thursday clothes. Thursday-ish. <laughs> Thursday-ish <laughs> Thursday clothes. What clothes? Casual. Like nice and casual, but not too casual. Okay. You know, so I'm looking forward to wearing it. How are you doing, Tokwe? I'm fine. So... Um, I forgot to mention this in my banter yesterday. On Monday, I spoke about the farm, and then I went yes. to Jora Market. Yes. Because I was trying to sample the pricing of things in the market. Guess what? People actually buy head of chicken, neck of chicken, mm. legs of chicken. Usually, I was moving, my, my, myself and my partner have been discussing that all these chicken heads, people buy it. I said, no, who will buy head of chicken and the, like the feet of chicken? I got to Jora Market, and people actually buy it. For what? Per weight. For whatever reason, really? chicken stock. Uh, yes. On the internet, people actually use it for chicken stock, but yes. they buy it. Surprisingly, what did you just stop looking at me? Ah, ah, it's you now. You mentioned it in the show today that you had hey, into Palmer. chicken. Okay. So she now brought me to her shop ah. and she was telling me, okay, this is how she sells it. Obasanjo Farms is everywhere. Wow. It's free publicity, but there's no competition. There's enough. <laughs> yeah. But I realized that yeah, we've actually okay. migrated largely into eating locally made chicken. Right. The frozen chicken we buy, actually, even if you go to Jora, and the Jora is like the headquarters of frozen food. Mm. They sell made in Nigeria more mm. than the imported one. So wow. whatever it is, the policies are working. Yeah. And today I'm right, going gradually to... Yes, um, facing maybe because it's own. tough to bring in the frozen one. Right. So now, yeah. then, then there's a market, yeah. is, it's Huge. good. It's a good business. So yes, they're, they're excited so about the prospects. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm happy that I can finally sell the heads of chicken. <laughs> People will buy it. Ah, like good. I like to do, you know, we do um, bone broth. Yeah. So you do use all the bone from like different kinds of um, like the cows and everything, but mm. it would be good. It's also good to add like chicken bones as well. Yeah, Not the head. Head. Good. yeah the just head. the what for the stock. The stock, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, and the juice and, and the, everything. Yeah. It's healthy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I would think you just maybe give it out to pigs or something. You, yeah. you. I mean, there are ways of. I was even that was my, my first time. Crush give it out to crush and but and the people actually buy and they cook and I think some cultures eat it. I eat head and legs. Yo, of a chicken. Of course. What I mean, the, the bananas? Bread, the bread, Ew, the what the really please stop talking? Ah. Ew, Seriously, for real? This idea about Chicken people. brain. Yes. You gotta be kidding me, right? <laughs> yeah. I have them. no idea. You know, I just not even remember. I remember that my mom would say to us, eat the brain, you know, to help it to help for your real? own brains. I guess. Hmm, different strokes for different folks. Yeah. <laughs> wow. One of that stuff that that's on the head, that, I don't know what they call that stuff. Oh, oh very I soft and nice. The crown. Yeah, the crown. Oh yeah, I love it. Yeah. Love I have it. never in my life had chicken. I've had it before. No. I've had it before. But chicken like feet I can do because I like sucking. But chicken head. And then I'm a good bone crusher. Oh my God, if you give me if you give me bones, by the time I'm done, it would yeah. be like sawdust. <laughs> How you doing, guys? I'm doing fine. Yesterday I used um, bolts. I went around in you know bolts, okay. Uber, yeah. yes, and I met a particular driver, and he complained about Nigeria from the beginning of the trip to the end. He was in front, of course, I was behind the windows, but he. The complaint, lamentation. yes, lamentation from beginning to end. Me that I like to see positive things and mm. whatever. Everywhere I turned, to see. I felt so. It was so depressing. Yeah. Now I understand the when people say positive energy mm. and being deliberate about people around you or what people say. I mean, it was so heavy on yeah. me. All of a sudden, everything it seems was crumbling. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but I get him. He, you know, because yeah. I was saying to him, you know, as I was about to enter, I said, "Please, where, where's your mask?" And then he showed it to me. He says, "You know what?" My problem is not even the mask. It's hunger. It's life. Oh. <laughs> I said, this mask oh. is nothing. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, God. Yeah, I, so I understand, but... Yeah, it's, 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 it's crazy. Mm -hmm. out there. We need to do what you we know, need to something do. happened yesterday, which I'm going to share that story sometime in the future, not now, but it happened to me yesterday, and it just gave me another light bulb effect that we are our own problems. Mm. You know, sometimes, I, and one of these is I get an opportunity to share that story. We just, we, we, we refuse to see that there's... That, that there's the light at the end of the tunnel. The, the, is the, because I think we also complicate matters ourselves as a people. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'll make that analogy. We're so used to negativity. We're yes. So used to, We're so to used everything to, not working we're out. We're so cynical about that every single thing. We can't see opportunities. We can't, we can't see solutions. Exactly. Mm. Thank you for helping me to put it. That's exactly. I We're totally not seeing I, it. I, I, yeah. I, see, I hear it. I see it. So I it's still Wednesday. Let's go on a break. We'll be right back. <laughs> Okay, thanks for staying with us. We're going to start with The Guardian today. 
<laughs> Gordon. Local airlines risk collapse as load factor declines. Why corruption terrorism fester by federal government? ECOWAS names ex-president Jonathan special envoy for Mali. Senate amends law imposes life imprisonment on kidnappers. Okay, let's take the major headline. Yeah, so local airline operators are, you know, not too happy with um, how, how it's been going on the flights and everything since the lockdown, I mean, the lockdown flights was taken down. So they said, you know, they had the, they were op optimistic about like a 70% um, traffic, but they're getting about 40%. So for a flight where, you know, how much the fuel cost, you have um, 150, 150 flight capacity, you have only about 30 people fly. It is at a loss. So they're saying that it's not very encouraging for them and they are hoping that the government can quickly release the bill out to help them with the operational costs and everything. They cannot increase prices because mm, passengers yeah. won't, uh, yeah. won't understand. Right. They cannot delay passengers for so long right. because they are waiting for more people. But they right. can passengers, collaborate. Yes. Yeah. And then they are saying to help them as well, international routes have to be open. And they're saying that um, the 14 day mandatory quarantine has to be taken out because that's the only way travelers would feel comfortable to travel. To travel. So well, it's not I don't know. looking so too well for them at I think that's where we are right now. Let's mm -hmm. we'll take the story of um, um, corruption, why corruption festers in Nigeria by the federal government. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Yemi Oshibaju, our vice president, was speaking at the ICPC webinar yesterday. It's an African regional webinar by the ICPC, and he mentioned the fact that secret ownership of companies is one of the key reasons for corruption. That it's not like secret ownership is illegal in itself, but more to the fact that it allows owners of companies secretly make money off the company and then we don't have proper tax remission. So there's tax evasion, money laundry and terrorism are financed by these secret ownerships. So um, his advice is that, um, our, that as a country, we must deal with anonymous corporate ownership because it covers multitude of sins. Mm -hmm. And in addition, the international community also mm. must help support and ensure that they help us get those um, funds, traveling those funds out. Uh, mm. restrict them from traveling out. Mm. Mm. Okay, moving on now to the nation. Kayama gets Buhari's nod on the 774,000 public works job. NDDC forensic auditors to examine 8,000 documents, says Akpabio. Lagos won't lament about doctor's strike, says Governor. Counseling Wasi may trigger criminality, says Afe Babalola. And Ondo PDP aspirants testify against Ajayi. Okay, let's start so with WASC. WASC. Yeah. yeah, so the cancellation of WASC, you know, um, our Minister for Education was saying that we're taking, we're going to be um, not participating mm. in this year's um, WASC, and really because of the pandemic and how to ensure that the guidelines will be followed during these examinations. But the founder of Afe Babalola University, Chief Afe Babalola says that this is not a good thing to do because it would it, it it's like it would be dangerous to do because all these millions of children were hoping to write their exams and it would lead to the word he says um, it would lead to uh, you know like a, da a dangerous threat to the lives of our future leaders. I don't I don't really agree with him because for me it's just one year. I don't think this stops them completely from mm. pursuing their dreams or studying. I think, though, that maybe um, the West African countries can sit together and find out what they can do for different nations mm. at their different levels of the pandemic mm. so that the children are able to write their exams or use um, mm. what they have worked through the year, like past assessments that right. they have used through the year. It's a difficult conversation them, yes. because nobody knows what everybody's saying a year. What if we don't have a vaccine by, by next year? Well, so we're hearing things years. like Russia and America. Yeah. We're, we're we're hearing stories of vaccines out there. So, so the point see. is that we don't know for a fact. Yeah. Even if they get it, how, how when we get it to Africa? There's so many yeah, factors. Yeah, yeah. So if we think first. it's one year and then one year come, happens and we still don't have the vaccines that we have. So maybe the earlier we resolve this issue, the better. But let, let's find another story. Kiamo, Kiamo. yeah. So, so um, Honorable Minister of State. Honorable Minister of State for Labor and Employment this versus the, the, House, National Assembly. the National Assembly. Yeah. They've been the back and forth between them concerning who has the right to employ this um, 774,000 people, and the presidency has given his nod to Kiamo to do the job. So um, Kiamo said through, uh, um, what he said was SMS to the nation that I've gotten permission from the president to go ahead, um, even though the director, national director for Directorate of Employment, national, the, the, the director general, Nasir Ladan, said he wasn't aware of the committee 
that was inaugurated to carry out this um, uh, employment. The good news is, whether we like it or not, 774,000 Nigerians will get a job for three months where they will be paid 20, 20 I think it's also written NDE DG officially, saying, listen, yeah. stop, hold, halt everything you're doing right okay. now. The president, listen, the president is his boss. I mean, that's, I mean, that's one arm of government. Mm. He reports to the president and says, go ahead, I'm giving you a job to do. The me. National Assembly, I think also the AGF also wrote to the National Assembly saying, listen, uncle, stay, calm down. Calm down. That's <laughs> not your area. Focus on your lawmaking. And yes, your job is to supervise, but you mm. can't insist on certain things when it comes to um, this area of the ministry. Okay, let's move on to the punch. So National Assembly sets for hot session as Buhari backs Kiyamo. Reps to probe alleged 365 soldiers' resignation. Missing Lagos nurse found in Oshun Hotel. Hmm. Ogun needs 226 billion to complete Shango Agbadu Highway. Overrule education minister on Wasi, reps tell Buhari. Songo Agbadu. Oh, sorry, Songo Aguadu. <laughs> COVID-19 cut off 40% of our revenue, says Oshimbajo. Okay, let's take a few stories here. The um, House Reps. of Reps want to investigate the alleged mass resignation. They said there are about 356 Nigerian soldiers that have resigned en masse. And they are one, you know, they need to investigate it. Of course, they are looking to many of the reasons that could have caused this resignation. We have seen videos of um, soldiers talking about their welfare, you know, and things like that. So they're saying those are some of the things that they'll be looking at, that uh, um, uh, the soldiers have talked about poor welfare arrangements. Um, they've talked about embezzlement of the allowances by their superiors. Uh, many soldiers have talked about um, um, yeah. cases of, you right. know, mutiny, which has resulted in just sporadic right. shooting. Right. Um, a particular, uh, what's his name? Um, a uh, military officer was almost lynched, mm -hmm. you know, by um, uh, junior soldiers. Right. You know, okay. there's just so much going mm. in there, and it just shows. So I, I'm thinking, you know, at first, we, there's something about the military. They sort of keep everything. It's a family. You keep everything. And now that we have soldiers just acting and reacting and okay. now resigning, it is a good time it's to so investigate right. what is going on here. Let's take a few. There's another human interest story there, a missing Lagos nurse. So she was missing from Bariga. For, so the, the, the family actually reported to the police, they were looking for her, all the phones were switched off, they couldn't reach her. Just for them to then find out, the police then found her in Ibadan, lounging in a hotel. And they, obviously, they found out that, asked her why, what happened, how did you get here? She said she doesn't know how she got here. She just found herself in this place. And, she, and the hotel um, owner said she's been there for, for about 14 days. Mm -hmm. She just found herself there. And that was it. Obviously, I don't even know if they can prosecute her for that because obviously she, she made the, the, the enforcement agencies um, expend a lot of their resources looking for her and just found out that she actually just left so seemingly voluntarily, voluntarily went to, to, to somewhere else. <laughs> and then there was a, also a story of a pastor, 54-year-old, who yeah. actually raped and defiled a 10-year-old. He, he lured her to bring a key for, for him into his room. As she pastor. entered, pushed, pushed her down and obviously had How his way with her. And um, thank God she was hmm. able to cry out and then he was arrested. <sighs> really, really sad. Moving on now to Vanguard. Uh, we talked about the National Assembly already. Let's find another story. Day seven, panel requests procurement files, grills for EFC unit heads. 15 months after 11 states yet to implement the 30,000 naira new minimum wage. Strikes on Wolu Medical Guild in War of Words. Those who swallowed NDDC funds must cough them out. Akwabio won't. I wanted to read that story. Mm. Go ahead, uh, which story so, do we have? So um, 11 states. Uh, Adamawa, Akwaibo, Manambra, Benue, Ikiti, Kogi, Plateau, um, Imo, Nasarawa, Oshun, and Taraba have all not started implementing the 30,000 naira minimum wage mm. till date. And so the statement is, and the, the, there's partial implementation of this in Bauchi, Oyo, Yobe, and Kebi but no implementation at all yeah, in those okay. 11 states. And the issues have always been with the lack of funds and they are trying to negotiate with the, their um, civil servants about their inability to pay that money. But I think that the government should look into it because when you make a policy and the state cannot afford it, then you shouldn't have made that policy in the first place. Cooperation is important. Okay, so uh, let's move on. I was gonna take the NDDC story, but I guess we'll talk about it a bit later. Yes, so there's so much going on Daily in that Daily Sun. Let's find a story we've not taken. Magu, day seven panel grills for EFC unit heads. Live jail for kidnappers and rapists. Hmm. Um, shake up as army appoints new GOCs. 
core commanders and others. Nwodo, IPOB leader, Kanu backs down. And striking Nwodo, IPOB leader, Kanu backs down. And striking doctors who have approved all allowances for health workers. Say some William. I read that story, but I guess we'll take it a bit later to get an update on Lagos okay. State. Okay. The final paper is Daily Trust. Let's take one story we've not taken. Kaduna attack. Kidnappers mm. demand 900 million naira ransom. Mm. Reps move to bar ex -electro uh, electoral officers from contesting election. And how we are turning scraps to fortunes in Bayelsa. Okay, which story? Yeah, Kaduna? so House of Reps is just saying that if you have been a member or a staff of the electoral. Um, yes, you cannot immediately run for office because you're part of the process of the election and you're privy to um, information that, you know, may seem like conflict of interest if you run for office. I'm thinking, House of Reps, are you sure you want to pursue this? Because a lot of people have said, you know, how uh, some people are governors, immediately they, ha they go into the Senate. So, yeah. well, let's see. Yes. Mm. So that's what they're saying. You okay. should get at least five years yeah, after like resignation mm. before ah. you go straight into mm. politics. <laughs> okay, that's all we can take on front page review. When we come back, we'll discuss our lineup of topics. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back. Welcome back to Your View. Thanks for staying with us. So, the issue of education is still hot. We're asking that should President Buhari overrule the education minister on the WASC examinations? What are your thoughts on this? You can call us on 70 8016 You can also tweet to us at TVC Connect. Please hashtag your TVC so we can read your tweets. So, from the papers today, we're, we read the story that the, uh, the National Assembly are urging the president to do a U-turn, um, saying that, the, the, that it's important for us to let the children go ahead and write their exams. We also saw Afe Babalala also lend his own voice to it, saying that it's going to affect the children emotionally um, if they're not allowed to write the examinations. But there are still two sides to this story, and, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. I'd like to open our phone lines to parents and your thoughts, mm. because, as I said, it's hot. Everybody's talking about it, and that's a major issue for this week. And we'd like to see your thoughts. Talk about okay, so for me, I feel that um, I'm still not hearing what I want to hear, mm. which is the minister telling me, what, you've given us a guideline. Mm. What is the Ministry of Education going to do to ensure this guideline is followed through with, like, okay, um, I remember you mentioning the fact that mm. Lagos State has done a check of all the schools. Mm. We had three months. We knew this exam was going to take place. Like, we knew this was going to happen. So, and we have a minister for state, and we have a, mini a substantive minister, two ministers with a full ministry, and we don't have a report on the state of the ed state of um, the physical facilities of all federal secondary school yet. Mm. That for me is an indictment on the ministry because these are things you should have done. You knew there was going to be exams, and you knew that you you, you had to make a decision concerning how the exams would take place. So, in the very minimum, there should have been an audit of all the federal universities, and if it is done, it would have been printed. My expectation, if if, if they had done it. It would have been in papers it's that possible that they've checked. done it and they, they, it's not available to, to us. But I think also to add to what you're saying is that, as I said yesterday, what's the data they're leaning on to make this decision? I mean, we'd like to put, I'm sure the minister That's would have provided that to the That's president. That's the biggest exactly, challenge is yeah. that what, well, there's no communication. So people can now be cynical about their decisions. And people will assume incompetence because you're not telling me, you're not giving me facts to make me believe that you've done it, you've, you have, you've done a good job and you're thinking in my interest. So my thought because of the way Nigeria has always been is to assume that this is my leaders, their children are cuckoo abroad or their children are doing online school in, in some private university. This is not affecting them. So they don't understand the plight of majority of Nigerians who are stuck with doing WASI, WAEK, all of that. And because of that, they would assume mm. that the government isn't sympathetic or listening to them. Mm. I don't even want the president to override this decision. What I want is the president to compel the minister to give information backing up this decision. Mm. Is that communication that we need? Do, well, Mariam, in your view, do you think the, the, the president should reverse this or do you think we should? Okay, so, um, you know, for me, I'm always very particular about safety and health, and especially when it has to do with our children. Um, one exam will not forever change their lives, that's what I believe. But it is important also as a country because. I, I've noticed it with every decision we've made concerning this pandemic. We have a shutdown, then we don't have a follow-through. Mm. So we shut down and then what? 
So you have asked these people not to write this exam. What is the plan? Okay, we're in conversations with WASC and we're looking towards three months because in three months we would have disinfected these schools and provided accommodation so that for the three days that they'll be writing, you know, things like that. Those are the sort of conversations I would like to hear now. We're still going back on, no, we're writing and no, we're not. Mm. So that is the it's thing. Beyond that. Well, it's beyond that now. We understand there's a pandemic. We understand that there are issues. But these children would need to write their exam sometime. Yes, if we say one year, as you pointed out earlier, you're not sure exactly. So you need to make um, you need to make decisions based on your new circumstances. I, I, I like that. I like that arm because the truth is that let us see what the plan is. So mm -hmm. you, you 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 suspend it. Yes. But there has to be a plan to do it at some point mm -hmm. because COVID doesn't give anybody a date or the day he's leaving. Exactly. So we don't know. So whether we like it or not, we must plan to do the examinations at some point. Mm -hmm. And that's the planning that Nigerian parents want to see. Exactly. Let us see that you're actually working towards something. Don't just give us a blanket, oh, it's been suspended. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can try and try and reverse it. Yeah. Another major category of people that we are not talking about are the idle hands, university students that are not doing anything right now. Like, what are the plans of the university? I know private universities are still engaging um, their students, but private public universities constitute a whole lot more. What is the plan? Like, mm. if there is no plan, you're just leaving them to do, to love, okay, we've been on lockdown, but now they've eased lockdown. What are you doing to the hundreds of thousands of university undergrads that have no idea when school will resume? Exactly, thank you. Let me take this call from Adeto. Adeto, are you there? Thanks for calling. Good morning, my name is Adeto. Morning. Yeah, I'm a first time caller. Welcome, Welcome to the, the show. show. Yeah, talking about this like issue, I'm a teacher, so I feel concerned. Um, in my own opinion, I would really appreciate if the um, federal government, the president, can have a rethink on um, the students being allowed to write their work examination. Um, talking about their health issue, or in, um, trying to make sure that they don't um, con um, touch themselves and then, you know, they can be very funny. If we can follow the protocol of um, the common entrance examination where parents get to drop their kids and wait for them to the end of the examination, they would write like maybe 10 papers per person. If there can be a guardian or a parent that will follow each kid to the examination center and wait for them to the end of the examination and then go back home with them so that they don't get to communicate with other kids or touch themselves or stuff like that, right. we are will be sure as parents that our kids are protected. Mm. And the school there on their own part, we have to put precautions in place. I think if this is put into consideration, then they can write an exam without an error. Mm. That's my opinion. Thank you very much on that. Yeah, you know, yeah go ahead, Maya. Okay, so talking about um, examination centers, um, I don't know how many they have now and where they are. So what I would suggest that the government can do is uh, have more centers and make it a little more local. So if you're in these communities, then you're able to write to centers closest to you so that we don't have people, because not everybody has a car and, uh, you know, can get their kids. Some people have to use public transportation and that's you know meeting different people to get right, to your exam right. so if we can now further localize these centers then it's easier to get to your center and back home yeah part of the suggestions that the Lagos State government was considering was that using all the schools both primary secondary mm -hmm. and even uh, the model colleges mm -hmm. every single available school should be used where this student will be spread out yeah so we have about i mean i think less than fifty thousand of these right. children across the state mm -hmm. so you ensure that you don't have you have a maximum of 20 children per, per class fantastic. you know so with that in place but it's not just about lagos state it's mm -hmm. beyond lagos there are other states so that's what we're asking for what plans have the other states put in place mm -hmm. because if the president reverses it it's not about reversing Yes. It's about what exactly have you put in place according to your state to ensure your children are safe. What about boarding house students? They're What's all the at plan home. for boarding house students to write their wasi? Eh, they are all at home right, right now. now. There's nobody. Yeah. You don't have to There's go no to boarding house. house. Just but if I'm, a, if I'm an XS3 boarding house student, mm -hmm. and boarding house is not resumed. We know. It's just the exam. Okay. So if they do this exam, yes. what would happen to those that, are, that their school was a boarding school? Okay, so I maybe have, if you had to travel for school. I have a school. nephew whose school is in, who is a, who lives in Lagos. Right. His school is in Abuja. Gotcha. He usually flies to the school. Right. Mm. So if he's supposed to write his exams now, right. and they've said, let's do this exam, right. how is he supposed to be covered? And there are many people like that that are boarding, boarding, boarding students who I haven't heard from the minister mm. what the plan is 
for them. So that is Would that be because it's universal? They could right. easily just simply take their name and then put them in a location where they are. Like, listen, technology has made life easy. It's just about so us being creative to find a solution I for a them. Man, by the way. I think that's, that's a good point. Um, Miss, I don't have the name. Go ahead, please. Tyle, thanks for calling. Go ahead, please. Yeah, good morning. I'm a first time caller. Welcome, Welcome to the, the show. show. Yeah, I feel the government shouldn't um, delay the students from writing their YA. Because already, staying at home, I, I don't feel the government is doing anything. No preparation, no proper planning, you know. Even if they stay at home for one year, you understand? At the end of the day, by that next year, some other sets will be preparing to write. And already, even at every year, after the YX exam, there are problems. Problems of um, seizure of results, you know, uh, different problems. So at the end of the day, if they combine the two sets to, two sets to write YX in a year, it's going to bring a lot of problems. And already there is marginalization between the poor and the rich in our educational sector. Already the children of the rich are continuing in their education. Mm -hmm. But the children of the poor are just rendered useless and the poor are just rendered useless and there is nothing they can do. You understand? Mm. So Tyle, like let me ask you a like question, Tyle. In a yeah. state like, in a, in a country like Ghana, that they reopened yeah. and about, I think about 55 children or so yeah. got infected. Mm -hmm. so a number of other countries where they were, there was a lot of pressure on the government to reopen to some extent. They had people infected. Is this a risk as a people were willing to take? Anyway, I, I, I think um, the COVID-19 issue from A to Z is a fraud on our side. Okay. Because if elections can take place, you understand, if the markets are opened, you understand, uh, even in the area, children are attending lessons and nothing is happening to anybody. So if the government is really, say, uh, uh, and as uh, to me, the government doesn't care about us before because we have our children go to school. They sit on the floor. There is no toilet. They go to the back of the classroom to pee. So why now? Why are they bothered now? You understand? Oh. So if anything didn't kill them then, I think they, we are delayed already. So many future have been delayed because of poverty and the government doesn't have anything to do. So let them leave everybody to go back to their exams, you understand, hmm. and do what they have to do. You get it? Because at the end of the day, many of these children, after writing this exam, they don't have hope. Many of them will still go back to learn one trade or the other. So I don't think why now. Government that doesn't care about our roads, they don't care of our health. We give birth to these children without any help coming from any way. You understand? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I think this is a fraud. Government should allow the children Thank you very much, Tayo. Honestly, I can't even respond to what Tayo said, but yes. I hope the Nigerian government is listening to Tayo. That's a citizen telling you yeah. that the whole so. thing is a fraud and that pretty much a Nigerian child goes to school and there's no hope, really. Mm. So, so you write so, it doesn't write so, like you open or you don't open or, it doesn't, it doesn't really affect me. anything. So, so a lot that's of, a very painful. Yeah, yes, you know, a lot of times when I hear people say, oh, this COVID is a fraud, you know, I just like, don't you see the number of people dying? But she's giving me insight, you know, to why people are saying it's a fraud. We have suffered throughout many years, year in, year out. We don't have, as I said, my, dri my driver, no, no water, no electricity. So these are already poor people suffering. Mm. Then there's a, an alien COVID, and all it wants you to do is stay at home. It does not make sense to anybody who's already going through those sort yeah, of issues. So when we see people abroad, people in Japan, they already have clean water, already yeah, have right. you know access to basic facilities. Yeah. So when they're asked to stay at home, they understand that, okay, yeah. this would make yeah. it better. In fact, but you, we, you I open mean, a it's whole a new kind yes, of one. Yes, has just... we have to wrap up on this. That's all we can take. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back. Welcome back to Your View. Thanks for staying with us so lately. They've seen a quite a bit of controversy over the alleged financial recklessness to the tune of 40 billion naira at the, uh, by the Interim Management Committee IMC of the NDDC between January and March this year. There's been quite a bit of confusion also on television. We've been watching different um, uh, verbal abuses against between Joy, the former MD of NDDC, Joy Noné, and also the current minister, um, Akpabio, Gozul Akpabio. 
and the big bit of bit of back and forth. Now we've just watched patiently to see where this will end. <laughs> Whilst we're trying to understand that, a journalist also made some hefty, very weighty allegations against um, contracts um, uh, that happened within, uh, within the NDDC. Mm. Joining us again right now is the journalist himself, Mr. Kola Wale Johnson. Good morning, sir. Are you there? Good morning, madam. I'm here. Good to have you on the show. You know what? Nigerians are confused, though, because one second, a woman is slapping Akpabiu. Next second, they said he, she's married, he, to, four she's married to four husbands. And then he, Akpabiu is now saying in the papers today that everybody who has swallowed NDDC money must cough it out. There's just so much drama happening. You made some allegations. Could you tell us, break it down for us? Help us understand what is happening? What even happened at NDDC? And why are we here just hearing about it today? All right. Uh, thank you for having me. First, um, let me pass a comment on uh, the drama between the former MD and the minister. I like you to understand that what happened was a shame. I mean, sorry, was very simple. <laughs> very, very, very simple. The, uh, the MD made allegations bordering on news governance against the minister. And you expect the minister to also reply, perhaps specifically to those allegations, and maybe go ahead to also expose some area, not personal life of the woman. What concerns us with money stolen, with uh, 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 with either a woman married four times, when will our society get, I mean, get away from this, this archaic thinking that would the only thing you can do when a woman is trying to assert herself is to go after her and start shaming her, either, either body shaming or whatever kind of shame. Slut shaming. I think it is very wrong. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the minister made the allegation on the premise that the, uh, the woman has a very bad temperament, responsible for the slap thing that happened. But I'm sure that as a subordinate, the woman would not have the guts to raise the hand to slap her minister. In fact, the person that appointed her, if he had not passed the mark <laughs> or the acceptable mark when they were uh, inside where they were. So I think. Nigerians should condemn that first. Then what? You're okay. trying to oppress a woman mm. by taking advantage of her. Okay. But you want to sleep with her huh. because you, you know because you are pointed at. I mean. Okay. You so let's put let's pack that. Her. So let's pack that for a second and because because of time. Now we mm. take that aside. Yes. Yeah. We move to the real issue. Yes. Uh -huh. Now the issues are very simple. When we when we started working on this, it was as though we won't see things that would be unhealthy. Well, we started working on NDDC last year, match, And sometimes towards December or so, yeah, December, towards the end of December, around December 29th, 30th, we unwrapped some few things that we could trace to the present uh, members. Because the years we were trying to harvest before, the president ordered a forensic to cover those years. So we were trying to now shift our attention to the present time. Okay. And we wrote a petition to the national but nothing was done. But well, we kept mining document until April, when the commission denied ever awarding any contracts since they got there. And we had documents, so 24, less than 24 hours after that denial, we came out with documents and statement that you have, you have awarded contract and you have paid. And there are some things with those contracts. Number one, they, they run foul of every extant law guarding that process. Procurement law was not respected at all. The amount was above the approval limit. Number three, the approval came for those contracts, came days, in fact, almost a month after they had been awarded. Now, they awarded April 6th, and the approval came from the president April 30th. So in, an, in anticipation of the approval, they spent money. However, <laughs> this is what happened. The president gave them about six billion naira, but the contract awarded was much more. One single company got 4.861 billion naira. Another company got about 1.2 billion. Another one got about 268 uh, 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 million. Then the last one got 749 million. Hmm. However, the contract was five 
at the earlier stage, but one was removed, perhaps, apparently because they knew that uh, the approval they would give them, you know, would run short. There was another company that was given a contract of 5.2 billion naira that was withdrawn later when they, uh, uh, when they sought it, perhaps when they sensed the reality of the approval they would get. Now, we came out to the public to prove that these contracts were scams. Number one, we mentioned that the company that was given a contract of 4.861 billion naira, it eventually got a total of 4.553 billion. So if it removed 7.5% as a uh, uh, attack from 5% back, that is what they take there, 12.5%. If that had been removed completely, you wouldn't have 4.553 billion paid to that company out of 4.86 billion. Now, after we raised the alarm, they discontinued the contract with two of the companies. Julius Zinga, they discontinue the, his own contract. Remember, that contract was in itself scandalous. They awarded a contract of 749 million naira for, a, for a, an engineering company, for a mining company, to come and do consultancy on media, consultancy on awareness campaign against COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Apart from the fact that this, I mean, the amount is scandalous, the company cannot handle it. Let me pause you for a second. Let me pause you for a second, caller. Yes, so I was actually going there because you were mentioning the amounts that were, you know, set out as contracts, and I wanted to find out what exactly uh, what these contracts were about because um, I think they do have a right to give out contracts for the development okay. of the Niger Delta. So, Very well. Yeah. Very well. Number one, uh, uh, they have they have a proof of limit. Mm -hmm. yeah. They have a which was not respected. Number two, contracts of that size would have been sent to FEC or to the president for approval, but that was not done. Okay. Number three, they kept denying that they, that they were yet to award contracts. So apparently those contracts were not meant to be done. I'll give you an example. For the company they gave 4.86 billion naira contract to, they just said for supply of medical equipment. There was no specification, there was no break it down. I mean, I mean, breakdown. So how then would the auditor, you know, receive such appropriately to know that number A, what B, number uh, 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 B, what happened? Then there is something they do. They have a warehouse containing lots of medical supplies. So the suspicion is this. When you put out such a contract like this without specification, perhaps nothing will be supplied. At the end, of course, you just open the store because they don't, they may not keep record, or they may not be able to trace the record because you don't even know the exact things they were supplied. So those were the uh, uh, issues wrong with that contract. Okay. Then Let number me... three, we mm. said this contract were beyond, uh, okay, you are a media person, a guru, a veteran, a professional. What do you think that you would do with uh, uh, a, a, a contract award of 7.9 million naira on, on consultancy, on awareness campaign? What is a consultant? Mm. So this are the All issues. right, let me go on a quick break, Kala Wale. I'll be with you in a moment. Stay with us, we'll be right Thank back. You. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back. Welcome back to Your View. Thanks for staying with us. We still have our guest journalist, um, Kola Wally Johnson. Yes, talk about the question. You know, you, you, these revelations, you are just calling figures that are worrisome, actually, and should scare Nigerians to how our leaders might be are culpable in yes. the corruption we're seeing, embezzling, Nigeria, is embezzling our future. Hmm. But there's another one, even as we have this information ongoing, as of July 11th, um, 1.5 billion naira was approved for the NDDC to purchase 62 vehicles for the commission. They want to buy 45 Toyota Hilux, two Toyota Costa buses. And I'm, I'm wondering... Prado, we forgot the Prado. Yes, they are buying four Toyota Prados, five Toyota Land Cruisers, one Toyota Camry, and five Toyota Hayas. Is this, is this in order of priority what we should be focusing on? Is it that the Niger Delta citizens don't deserve to have this money equip their hospitals? Or what is going on? Who do we hold accountable? Who is approving these sums for vehicles in the midst of COVID-19? Kolawali, are you still there? Oh, oh. Mr. 
This is <laughs> Mur Muriel, I, is I, I feel and I, I'm happy that we had someone um, green and gold. Um, um, Ugochi. 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 Ugochi went in recent times, in the, in, within the past three, it was three years ago, mm. that she went into Niger Delta and had pictures on, on, on um, if you go to YouTube, if you check Vice, there are videos from two years ago of how terrible illegal, illegal um, bunkery and po the pollution level, yeah. how people have cancer in their 40s in Niger Delta, they talk to them and say the oil comes from us. So they give you this 13% derivative. They give you money and then your own leaders are the ones siphoning money. So I'm, 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 I'm concerned about how we can keep taking this mm. and keep soaking it and keep accepting it and then we play lip service to corruption. That was then anti-corruption. So, and, the, and the easiest culprit to say, oh, they don't like us, they hate us. You know, we now start paying the yeah, ethnic uh, card uh, and say, oh, the president doesn't like us. But from what? Joy is saying the president is very, very um, concerned about that region and he's putting all the right resources to ensure that there's development there. But obviously, the resources have been siphoned. I really like to get 600 million for back I have a question. For it him. is everybody that approved that contract should be not only should they be arrested, but yeah. everybody that approved it. It doesn't make sense. Consultancy money. But well, these are still allegations. Though. Yes. I mean, we don't know that for a fact. So, Mr. because the minister himself has said there's no missing money. Yes. But no, there's no missing. Yes. This is said, no yes. Missing. So, there's nothing, there, there's a 400 billion that they're looking for. There's no missing money. He said that there used to be over 300 accounts for NDDC. They have just one account. And in that case, it means that taking out or, in, you know, putting in of that account will be very visible. So, I guess we'll wait for the investigative um, panel to be done. But it's very, you know, it's very insightful to see what um, Mr. Johnson himself has come up with. Okay, um, I, there was a little conversation, I think we saw a video, where he seemed to be giving, saying his allegations. And somehow my own problem has always been the response on the government side. You know, it, we take with such levity. Sometimes, you know, they, they laugh. I'm like, oh, you're just saying numbers. It may seem funny to you, maybe because you have more information, but Nigerians are watching. We're hearing big numbers just flying left and right. We don't you know, understand where they're going. So that was can really we interesting. take it seriously? That it, money was disbursed April 6th. Before mm -hmm. the approval. Approval came April 30th. Oh, my so goodness. Who was this? In and, this same country. And it's been so ongoing. You, this is not the first time we've been, had scandals within the NDDC. NDDC has always had... You know, Minister Fashola has always complained about the procurement process. Mm. First, it's cumbersome. Mm. And then there's so many people you have to hand out here. You have to give something to. It's not a smooth process. So money can actually release our coffers without proper presidential or fake approval. And that, the, the amount of money in question, billions of naira. How do, how do you get that kind of money approved without fake? So yes, okay. 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 says they asked for NDDC to solve the region's problem to develop Niger Delta, but many years down the line, not, nothing to show for, nothing mm -hmm. to show. All they do is develop their pockets. Um, but the same Bagit Geshe is also saying the ongoing contract saga of NDDC is another sad chapter of corruption in Nigeria. The government must bring everybody involved to book. Those figures are intimidating billions, millions in these COVID times. I have to run up. Unfortunately, we're having technical issues. We can't get our guests back, but we will do the show again. We'll bring him back at some point. Yes, but will. one thing I got from this whole conversation when I even watched him on television and, when, and now is the fact that there's a cycle. Mm. So you know a big man and you agree on a contract. So I'm going to be a consultant. I'm an engineering company. I'll consult for maybe for Niger Delta, COVID-19, whatever it is. And you use your office to get approvals. The money comes in and then you pay maybe, maybe 5 or 10% to certain consulting firms to actually do some kind of a job. The real money, according to Okolawali, goes out, is now distributed to private accounts. I saw the video. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He said it very clearly that the money comes in because he was able to trace that money to private accounts. So, the problem, therefore, is that Nigerians must see. So forget the, the billions you are hearing. Understand that when people get this money, they take just a small portion to do a tiny bit of the work and then share the rest. Mm -hmm. And that's the real crux of that corruption that we're trying to fight. And it's institutional. Mm -hmm. So that means that whether this, this Apabio leaves or whoever comes in, the same thing has been happening since NDDC got was, from, was, 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 was inaugurated. Exactly. It's been happening over and over again, which is why they will say they've spent Seven. billions and trillions has gone through NDDC, but you go through all the NDDC states and wonder what has been the done process. here. Where's the, where are the hospitals and where are the schools? 
Where are the basic amenities? Right. We have to run off. From, we have generally managing our business. Mm -hmm. When the NDDC matter just came to me. Hey. So barely now. Now that, uh, now and honestly, the so this whole, why we, we, yes now, we didn't want to enter the matter, but when we saw that the thing did not go away. Mm -hmm. So we know what, we will bring back Kola Wale and we'll yes. still try to get um, a someone few others to come and let's get information from, from the NDDC, someone from the government, somebody from the minister, the minister, the ministry. Mm -hmm. Let us talk to people and let us know exactly what is going on. That's all we can take. When we come back, we discuss issues on how to stay out of debt. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back. Welcome back to Your View. Mm -hmm. Thank you for staying with us. So, debt can mess people's mind up. It literally cripples your psyche. Creating debt prepayment plan sounds theoretical, but sometimes you kind of try to put it together. Now, um, there's also a lot of emotional stuff that follows when you, are, when you are in debt and you feel like the whole world is crashing down on you. Mm. Joining us now is an entrepreneur and the founder Smart Money Africa, the sexy Arrested Ugu. Sorry, sex is not a morning <laughs> word, right? Hi, Dean Arrested. Thank you, I'll take it. <laughs> good, good. So, debt management, especially during this COVID period, um, issues of um, your own, your landlord, your own. Um, car debt, car loans, you're owing the wigs, you know, you're paying, you know, these are things that compile together and make people frustrated, especially in this period. How best can we organize our debts and pay for them? Okay, so first of all, I think that the first thing that people need to look at is their debt to income ratio. So, for example, if you owe, a, if you earn 100,000 naira and you owe 50,000 naira, then your debt to income ratio is 0 0.5 it's usually recommended that you keep your debt to income ratio to 0.35, right? Mm. Because you want to keep it manageable. And I think that this usually starts the problem. When we have an, a money issue, we instantly think about, oh, who can I borrow from? Or who can I collect from? Without necessarily thinking about, okay, how much do I earn now? And in the worst case scenario, what can my income support in terms of debt repayment? So we usually get it wrong and we're over leveraged from the beginning. So it now becomes a headache when something like COVID happens, right? Mm. But obviously we live in Africa, so it's hard. People want to borrow money or take capital from where they can get it um, when they're running businesses. You know, it, it happens. But I think that the best thing is also to look at the behaviors and um, decisions and thinking that got you into debt in the first place, yeah. right? Okay, so, so sometimes I we're, we don't we don't understand the difference between good debt and bad debt. So good debt is when you are saying, you know what, I want to take money to um, invest in a productive asset. So the capital value of that asset is going to grow over time. Mm. And I, can, I have enough cash flows from that asset to be able to cover the cost of the debt and the debt itself over a period, right? But most people take debt to buy things that make rich people richer, as opposed to necessarily thinking about um, whether I'm taking debt to um, invest in something that's right. going to make me money. Right. Okay. So let, here I am. So I have. I have. Usually okay, she can hear me. So Arese, I'm asking. Um, I just found out about Arese and about the income debt ratio, but I already have so many bad debts, and I'm trying to get out mm. of it. What is the first thing that I should do to, you know, get out of it and then, you know, make better, then make better. Um, financial decisions so the first thing is a debt repayment plan and you know a lot of because i coach a lot of people on their personal finances and usually when i first tell them you need a debt repayment plan they're like are you joking please this is not economics as in theory right this is my real life how am i going to get the money to pay life how am i going to get the money to pay the debt but the thing is a debt repayment plan gives you clarity around where you pick where you are right now so it helps you take it take stock of all the debts that you have and prioritize them. Which one um, has the highest interest or which one is on my neck? Maybe your landlord is calling you and stressing you. Do you have to pay that first or do you have to pay the bank loan first because it has a, a higher um, interest and if you leave it for longer, it will, um, it will become more expensive. So just putting down all the debts that you have 
not not calculating it in your head, actually seeing it on a spreadsheet, um, putting the interest or of, of how much it costs. Um, to cover that debt and how long it will take you to pay it. And it's important for us to not avoid, for us to really confront the debt and then start to have conversations with the people that we're owing to say, listen, this is how I can manageably pay you. It's not going to be um, an easy conversation. They're not going to be like, oh yes, it's fine, pay when you like. But debt repayment is not supposed to be comfortable. It's supposed mm -hmm. to stress you until okay. so you have done it. But it's important for you to have a debt repayment plan and then come up with a plan to um, fund the debt repayment. So what can I do to, re to um, reduce my expenses so that I create extra income in my budget so okay. that I can aggressively pay down the debt? What can I do to um, monetize some skills that maybe I've not used in a while or think through what, what skills um, I, can, I can use to take advantage of the opportunities that these um, on certain times have presented, right. what can I monetize so that I can create cash flow um, to pay off the debt? So it's not um, it's not a simple thing. There's a lot of emotional you know turmoil that comes with debt, and you have to be you have to motivate yourself. Basically, right, right, right. Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to ask concerning you know um, in recent times we now do a lot of um, consumer financing, buy a TV and yeah. spread payment over a year, buy your fridge, buy solar, buy all of that, and many people pre-COVID had committed themselves to a lot of these things. Within the COVID, many people have lost like the 30% or 50% of their yeah. income. How can they, within still being within COVID, adjust to the reality of most of what I have in my house? Is I'm paying for it in installments and now I don't have the money to continue payments. Very what can right. I do? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe maybe returning it is part of is part of what you have to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it depends on your particular situation. But this is what I mean when I say that people need to understand um, the difference between good debt and bad debt because consumer debt is part of bad debt. So I'm not saying don't take consumer debt at all, but you need to take it um, in comp knowing what your income can support, even in the worst case scenario. So you can't take debt to buy a TV. Hmm. You can't take debt to buy, um, you know, a fridge. It's not, it, these are not good habits, oh, right? Goodness. You wait till you can afford the fridge <laughs> before you buy it, hmm. as opposed to taking debt. Because you have to ask yourself, if I take debt to buy a TV, does the TV produce an income to um, pay for that. me? No, it does not. So we need to, we need to actually, now more than ever, we need to um, start putting expense control measures in place. Because your our incomes are not certain, they're definitely they've definitely reduced for a lot of people. Um, so we need to start thinking about, you know, how we think about debt. Okay. Maybe you don't need that TV right now. Maybe you don't need that car right now. Mm. We have to adjust our behaviors when it comes to um, taking consumer debt. All right. Let me hold you for a second. I have a call. Good morning, Chukudu. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thanks for calling. Go ahead. You have a question for Arisa? Hello. Go ahead. You're live. Go ahead, please. Okay. 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 Yeah, um, but somebody is still talking. Can I go answer something? Yeah. Go ahead. You're like, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about uh, this debt thing. Yes. Talk me about. Hello. Stop listening to the television. Listen to me. Yeah, I can okay. hear you clearly. Go ahead, please. Okay, okay, okay. Now, um, can I suggest we must uh, be careful in this time? when uh, money is hard to get. But then, uh, yes, one thing, mm -hmm. and I'm not happy that, you know, it's difficult to get to you. And if you have to start starting... I, I, can't, I can't make out what he's saying. I'm so mm -hmm. sorry about that. Chukudi, I do apologize. Maybe we'll have to call you back so we can hear you properly. Arese, um concerning Hi. issues of prioritizing uh, what we need to pay back. You, saw, you talked about having a conversation mm -hmm. with those who are owing the money, but in reality, what are the kind of things we are owing? We are owing car loans. Uh, maybe in mm. our country, we don't do much of mortgage right now. But there are car loans. Mm. There are um, personal expenses, you know, like your hair. I mean, hair these days are expensive. You pay it two, three, four times. Um, how do we prioritize what we need to do? How, what, 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 how would you advise us in prioritizing debt repayment? Okay, so it depends on the individual. You have to look at a few things. One, what are my financial obligations? Mm. What, what debt 
um, do I have that is really pressing right now that has to be paid before everything else? So again, it might be because the person is on your case a lot, or it can be because there's a high interest on the debt itself, especially those um, consumer um, loans where you've taken it for your for your car or for your TV. The rates on that on those are um, higher. So you need to work out. You need to map it out and then work out. For my particular situation, which debt is most pressing? So that would depend on the person. For some people, it might be, you know what, let me start with the smallest one first and just start knocking out the debt um, so that I build momentum and um, I'm like gingered to finish paying off. Mm. So it depends on the person. Okay. But the things I would look at are the interest rate and how pressing it is in terms of how the creditors are on your case. Right. Okay. okay. So there's something that I hear a lot of people complaining about in Nigeria, which is... Um, uh, owners or uh, employers of labor are owing their employees for many months, but they are still able to go on vacations and you know pay their own personal bills. Is a business owner mm -hmm. meant to stop, you know, all the expenses on their personal luxuries to pay up um, employees, or it, the business has to do that by itself? And if the business can't pay it, then it's none of the business of the employer himself, who may have more, who may have personal money outside that business. So it's a complicated one that, you know, brings into play like ethics and your own personal um, values, right? So first of all, your business and yourself are two separate entities. So whatever you're, you're doing for yourself should not have to affect your, um, your business. But I do think that employers need to be responsible because the first respect that your employees owe you is their salary. So you have no business going on vacation when you're owing people um, you know, salaries and things like that. It is it's unethical, it's wrong. Um, we need to be able to prioritize salaries um, over our own personal like enjoyment. No, but maybe vacation is a bit um, um, extravagant. extravagant, but pers my personal story, within the lockdown, I changed my car yeah. and um, because of the lockdown, I slashed my staff salary. Now, my car is mm. a result of savings. I've been saving since. <laughs> so it, it's easy for them to now see, uh -uh, and Sakwa does is not paying us what she should pay us, that she got the company, but then she bought a new car. You know, so mm. it, 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 it's, it, now, it, it now makes mm. you feel, make you look like you're not unethical. being, you're not, you're not unethical, but in actual fact, there are two different situations. Exactly. There are two different things you have planned mm -hmm. for. And how can we now prepare people to understand? Also, how can we impute the culture of savings for what they want and all of that? How do we find that balance? Mm. Um, oh, so it, you know, situation, I start by the fact that for some need to start from your business finances. So what you're doing for yourself needs to be very separate from what you're doing for your business. Mm. I think the um, distinction always comes when people are using business funds to fund maybe buying a car or spend. using business funds to um, fund vacations or things like that. And then your staff are seeing you do that and they're wondering, hold on, how can you say that the business cannot afford to pay me the salary you were initially paying me, but, you are, but you, it can afford to buy your car, mm -hmm. right? So I think it depends. If your savings were separate from your business um, funds, then you're well within your right to do that. But I think another question we also need to ask ourselves, and a lot of like my mentors and other business owners at the start of COVID were saying was, Arisa, we can't hear you. The last thing we heard was mentors. Right because these are tough times. Okay, so I said, I was saying that I was having conversations with my mentors right. and different business leaders at the right. start of COVID right. and just thinking through what is the priority right now as a business owner, given the fact that you're responsible for so many different people and their families and their, you know, lives and this has happened and nobody could have predicted it. So what do you prioritize? Do you prioritize yourself? Do you prioritize your investment? Do you prioritize your employees' well-being? Mm -hmm. And I think that it depends on the individual. Right, right. It depends right. on, on whether you're, you're um, placing empathy over um, mm, profit? money or over finances. Mm. Right. Arisa, we because I know people who have their personal income to pay their staff salaries during these COVID times because it's like we're a family. I don't want you to be put out. Mm. Right, right. Now, Arisa, we want to make money. 
You know, we we mm. we want to make extra income. Where many of us, obviously, our salaries have been slashed, and we and we're thinking, what are the opportunities out there during this period? You know, what can we look into to get some extra money? Do you have any advice for us? Well, we're all trying to figure it out. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what I, <laughs> yeah. What I, will be that if you're really looking at you know the landscape um different problems are being, or different problems are being um highlighted because of covid but different opportunities are also um, arising and i think it's about figuring out like where can opportunities are coming into play right now that i can tap into and event planners that are now switching to virtual events like how can we do you know smaller events as opposed to like the big ones with um, mm. that you know we were used to how do we curate smaller cute events that are virtual um that maybe will not bring me as much of an income but in the meantime it, it helps to shore up some of the revenue that i've lost from um staying at home during covid or if you if you think about the fact that um consumer spending or e-commerce has changed like the, the way that we, we um, purchase things now is different in nigeria we had just slowly started um getting used to buying things online mm -hmm. but it has it hadn't really taken the way it had taken um you know in other countries mm -hmm. but with covid everybody's locked in their house nobody can go anywhere so if you want to buy anything you actually don't have a choice you yeah. have to find ways to buy it um, oh, online. So it's changed in that way. And I see that as an opportunity for many small businesses to like reduce their costs now that they can they um, can service their customers directly from like their website or their Instagram page. Right. So it's about looking for those opportunities and seeing how what has changed and how can I plug into what has changed. Okay. Yeah, okay, so I read one of your books. Uh, I've read both your books, but the second one, The Smart Money Tribe. <laughs> the Smart Money Tribe. Uh, you know, I like the idea of people coming together and sort of pulling resources together for, um, you know, for like a common goal, yeah. financial resources. So especially at this time with um, salaries slashed, things like that, would you advise that this is a good time to do that, to come together, put um, resources together for common goal, common financial goals? Most definitely. Most definitely, but with care, with caution. So I, I definitely believe in people collaborating to compete. And what I mean by that is pooling our resources so that we can achieve a common goal because we're more powerful together than we are um, individually. But I think it's important for you to do that with guidelines. Mm -hmm. I always, in my book, I wrote about ha having a constitution. So you and your friends deciding I want to, we want to start investing together and creating, you know, some kind of investment um, um, vehicle, but you need to have guidelines. So what happens when we, um, what's the minimum amount that we're going to be contributing to invest every month? What happens when one person decides to exit? What happens when um, I see another opportunity and I want to take my money out and, you know, invest in it? How do we decide what we're investing in? How do we decide how much risk we're taking as a group? So I think it's a great idea for people to collaborate, to compete, but I think it's also important to have contribution oh. regulations that everybody has to fall to be legal. You Oof. do a proper, you know, me and my friends, I left this together. Breaking up, they can't hear you. Put the um, guidelines in place to, to preempt um, or to stop, you know, um, future problems. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to debt and servicing our debts. Um, how would you propose someone goes to negotiate with a debtor? Somebody that a debtor goes to negotiate with the person is indebted to. What are the things that can, what are the language to use and how can we... <laughs> you know, <laughs> get into the psyche of the person because really everybody is giving one excuse or the other, you know, but like what are the things, what are the talking points that would help someone indebted get like favor, you know? I know we pray about it, but sometimes the language you use are able to get you. So what would you say if I want to negotiate with someone I'm owing money to give me a bit of a rebate for a while? Okay, so um, this is a tricky one because obviously <laughs> different people have different temperaments when it comes to uh, money. There's some people that will be understanding and think, well, we're all going through a tough time and if this person can't pay, you know, they can't pay, I need to figure out another way. Or there are people who are going to be belligerent and like, 
give me my money, I'm going to kill you, all of that. So it depends on, you know, the level that you're dealing with. But I always advise that, first of all, the first thing when it comes to debt is that people are avoiders. Most people are avoiders. So they don't want to look at the bills. They don't want to confront the debt. They don't want to pick up their phone to talk to the debtors. Mm. They're avoiding, right? And saying, Shebi is money that you want. When I make the money, I will um, <laughs> I will pay it. So but the, but, the, um, mm. but that, I, that mindset, right, can put you in trouble because you're not being considerate of the other person, right? Um, and it's important that you confront it. Even if they're angry, you have to tell yourself that they are entitled to their anger because you borrowed the money right mm -hmm. and you need to pay it back and you are the one that has fallen short so i think first of all is about working on ourselves not being avoiders confronting it um understanding that if the person is angry no matter what they are entitled to their anger and you have to manage that you know accordingly i think it's also about being considerate of the fact that okay so you know when you say put a debt repayment plan i'm not saying say well what i can afford to pay is 10,000 every month. That's not convenient for the person that you owe, right? Mm. It, and it's not supposed to be convenient for you, right? So it's also coming up, up with something that's realistic. If this person borrowed me 1 million, how, how quickly can I pay it back? Which will mean denying myself some things, which will mean uh, short-term sacrifices so that I can pay this off as quickly as possible. Mm. Not being an avoider and avoiding communication and avoiding... Um, just even just confronting it right. i think com constant communication is key Important. you don't wait for them to call you you right. call them um, right. explain the situation explain how you're going to pay what your right. plan to okay. you know repay is what you're doing to um create the money to put keep them in the loop right keep them, okay keep them in the loop we have loop. to wrap up yeah we have to wrap up with you, Arrested, but we have to bring you back concerning issues of the stock market because we know <laughs> that um, we need a lot of information on that. At this period, people think that during the, the time of pandemic like this might be a good opportunity to invest in stocks, but we'll bring you back to help us enlighten us on that. Thank you very much, Arrested, for joining us this no morning. We've been speaking with so the founder of Smart Money Africa, Arrested Ogu. Uh, before we wrap up, we got news of um, the young lady, Tulu Lokwe, um, um, let me get her name right. Tulu Lokwe Arutile. She's mm -hmm. actually uh, the Nigeria first female combat helicopter. Young lady. Yeah, I just saw that. She died in a, yesterday. Uh, the pictures are really, really sad. I mean, it's painful to see a young lady who actually got in, into the Air Force um, lose her life doing something obviously that she loves doing. Our hearts go out to her family. Her family. Um, may her soul rest in peace. And um, mm -hmm. the, the Nigerian Air Force released the press saying that she was actually, um, let me just read it, said the death of the flying officer to look where, who died on Tuesday, said that she's, um, I'm trying to see how they described her here. Until her death, uh, Officer Rotile, who was commissioned into the National Air Force, Nigerian Air Force in September 20, 2017 as a member of the HQ NDA RC-64 was the first ever female combat helicopter. NDA RC-64 was the first ever female combat helicopter pilot yeah. in the service. Now that's no small feat for a young lady. Sure. Uh, our heart goes out to her family. May her soul rest in peace. Amen. Have a fabulous day. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye for now.